So here we have the Spanish Civil War, part two of the short-term clauses. And you get a part two because I am so succinct when I speak that really, it's just too short. So here you go. Here's a little bit more for you. Um, this one is going to look at the Second Spanish Republic. Enjoy. And we have these learning outcomes um, that are the same as the previous one. Understand the short-term factors, this time obviously focusing on the Second Spanish Republic that helped bring out the Spanish Civil War, and to synthesize these long-term and short-term factors into coherent arguments. Which brings us to the Second Spanish Republic, which lasted from 1931 to 1939. So this is the allegory of the Second Spanish Republic, all of these awesome, awesome things like there's a lion and some chick with some scales and stuff, you know, whatever. Anyway, um, so basically uh, Primo de Rivera stepped down in March of 1930 and it's all kinds of sadness because he like went into exile and like Seriously, like a few weeks later, he done went and fell over dead. Mm-hmm. And King Alfonso, I put the third, but you know, add an extra X in there, abdicated the throne. And um, essentially he is going to go into exile and is going to hang about and try to um, overthrow the Republic. <laughs> um, until, uh, well, basically he dies. Um, the Republic, and then um, he remains in exile, uh, and it's his son, Juan Carlos, who later um, takes over after Franco. And so one of the cool things you can see here is even um, the picture to the right. These are the stamps that were uh, issued under King Alfonso the Thirteenth, and basically the Republic just printed the Republic over it. So same stain which is kind of indicative of uh, the whole change anyway, right? So with the, um, with the abdication, uh, another general actually took over for, for uh, Primo de Rivera, and then um, elections were called. And so uh, in 1931, the Republicans came to power um, and the parliamentary system was restored, but we'd already had a seven year break under a system that was already kind of so Zamora came to, comes to power and later Azana. We'll look at that a bit more um, in more detail later on. And so Payne says that the Second Republic would have stood a better chance of being successful if it had links to the historic and conservative institutions that would have mediated and channeled new mass democratic forces. So we have these new mass democratic forces, that is, we have um, popular movements, a lot of people wanting to push democracy. But when, in order for that to work, according to Payne, basically you need, um, while people are, the, this mass democratic movement is like pressing on the gas, you know, just gunning it um, and driving really fast down the road, basically you have these um, historic institutions like the monarchy um, that, and like the church, that would have been able to basically act as a break to keep the Republicans from driving over the cliff. And so that's basically what happened, is the Republicans come in and they essentially reject, um, you know, the monarchy is gone, so that as a mitigating force that acts as a bridge between the old and the new, that's no longer there. Um, and it uh, is made up of these leftist organizations that are largely anti-clerical and essentially um, reject the, uh, the Catholic Church. And so you don't have that conservative break. And then of course, you've had the seven year interim between um, the parliamentary system, the constitutional monarch monarchy um, parliamentary system and the second republic. So again, no bridge, okay? the vast majority of the people who come to power are really good at thinking, but really bad at ruling. So they have very little political and government experience. 
Um, and they, so they don't know the mechanisms of government and how it's supposed to function and how to really govern this, um, this state of disparate uh, peoples. Um, and they are also very insular as well. They are no better in, in, in some ways than the people on the right because um, they've spent all of their time kind of thinking uh, at each other and talking to each other. So um, they're out of touch. They know what people on the left want and they know what this all of the socialist ideology. These guys are largely middle class, maybe also upper middle class. Um, they're well educated. They've been exposed to these foreign ideas and they've adopted these foreign ideas wholesale which means that they are actually disconnected with the other groups in society that is the other elites right um and the nobility and so on and so forth but also the poor people and here we have the proclamation of the second spanish republic in barcelona and so one of the things here is this was a hugely joyous occasion especially for some place like Barcelona and Catalonia because of what this is going to represent for those regions in terms of nationalism. They introduce legislation to restructure and reorder society. So they go in and they basically feel like they know all that is wrong with society. They need a government that is um, more responsive, right? They need a government that is modern. In order to bring Spain into the 20th century, you need to have 20th century ideal ideology. And that's basically what the Republicans were doing. Again, it's that left-right shift. It's totally with, in keeping with the, um, with the uh, general political situation in Spain. And so, um, yeah. And so, again, it's an extreme move, move to the left, nothing to moderate it. They re introduce military reform to reduce the number of officers in the core. So essentially, again, um, the military is incredibly bloated. And because the military is so bloated, it is a huge drain on the financial resources of the state. So they attempt to mitigate some of that by reducing the number of officers. People aren't happy. They um, take revenge <laughs> against the ministers of the previous dictatorship. So essentially, um, after Primo de Rivera sat down and the, follow and the next general took over, um, the Republicans tried to stage a coup and take over the government, and they were squashed down. And so elections were called only once it got to the point that people were like, there was just so much unrest. So um, what they basically decide to do is the government, the ministers that are in place, that is the bureaucrats that are in place who know how a government run and who are trying to run the government, they take revenge against them and basically oust them. So in order to reorder Spanish society, which the Republicans felt was their mission, their goal was to restructure and create a modern society. And so they're going to go about doing this in a number of different ways. And here um, with this, we're going to take a general overview and then we're going to look in greater detail at the Second Spanish Republic. So the first thing in 1931, we have a constitution um, that is uh, introduced, right? And so this constitution is going to reintroduce introduce universal suffrage that is allowing everyone the right to vote. And actually, it's even more advanced than the previous constitution they had because the previous one provided universal male suffrage. Now, this is going to be for men and women. Again, ideological connections. They're going to abolish the nobility. Again, ideological connections. And they're going to act um, very aggressively against the Catholic Church. And so one of the important aspects of the Constitution is this Article 26. And this Article 26 um, is pivotal for a number of reasons. First, it allowed the state to dissolve the religious orders. So Spain, historically, very Catholic. 
and some of the most famous Catholic orders like the Jesuits, um, uh, which, who, which have had influence throughout um, Europe as well as the Americas, the Inquisition, look that one up, fun times, burning at the stake, torture, the Inquisition. Um, and so, so the, it gives the state the ability to dissolve religious orders. So things, um, orders as famous as the Jesuits, there are a number of different um, sub orders that basically had different um, goals uh, of nuns, of monks and priests. And so what they're doing here is this article 26 is um, clear, provides for clear separation of church and state. And not only are we going to separate the realm of the state of the government from the realm of the religion, but it's going to place the needs of the state above that of the, of the Catholic Church. So the power of the state and whatever it needs to do is going to be greater than the um, spiritual power of the, um, of the church. And it also serves to break the church's political control. They're going to end religious education for the most part, like for example, the Jesuits, um, one of their main goals was education. So they ran universities, a number of universities in the US and Europe are Jesuit um, universities. And so, um, they, so the church funded universities and taught the universities, as well as um, a lot of the primary secondary education. And so what it does here, again, it breaks the power of the church in terms of indoctrinating the, the people. And, it, the, and now the state is going to assume the role, the job of educating society. They also introduced divorce. So the idea here, again, limit the power of the church um, by introducing divorce, giving women the opportunity to get out of marriages they no longer wanna be part of, as well as men. So what they're doing here is they're taking marriage from being under the purview of the Catholic Church and now making it a government thing. It is the state that decides or that um, governs whether or not marriages exist, not religious law, not the Catholic Church. And so the head of the government basically said in, in regards to this Article 26 of the Constitution and the anti-clericalness, don't tell me that this is contrary to freedom. It is a matter of public health. So in his idea, this ending of religious education and so on and so forth was not impinging on um, civil rights or freedom, that they needed to do this because doing this and divorcing the people from the power of the Catholic Church and the superstition and the um, you know backwards thinking, so to speak, in their, in their terms, is actually healthier for the population as a whole and will help Spain basically heal and be ready to join the 20th century. They also implement a 1932 statute which gave some autonomy to Catalonia in terms of education, taxes, and the police. Again, you can connect this to the long-term causes um, and why this is going to uh, engender, that is generate support for the Republic from certain groups of people and um, generate hatred for the Republic from certain groups of people. Oops, question is here. Hold on one moment. So they also um, have the law of Ag agrarian reform in 1932. And essentially what this did was um, redistribute land. So land redistribution to provide the peasants with land that they could own and therefore use to feed themselves rather than being tenant farmers of wealthy landlords. So given um, all of the stuff that we've spoken about previously from the long-term causes, which groups will be angered um, and or, there's supposed to be a slash in there, alienated by such policies and why? Pause the video, 
take a little bit of time to kind of pull, marshal your thoughts together, make connections, and analyze. So um, essentially, we have uh, Zana's government is going to fall, and following that, there are going to be more uh, moderate coalitions. So essentially, um, the left comes into power in 31. In the next set of elections in 33, the right comes into power, and not fully, but they moderate um, some of the excesses of the left. And so they try to undo some of the previous reforms, obviously. Um, some people are going to be happy with the um, changing with the reformation of the reforms and some people are going to be dissatisfied with it. You should think about which groups will and which groups won't and what that means in terms of the Spanish Civil War. Um, we have the left is going to be angered uh, by these reforms of the reforms and we're going to have a lot of uprisings we're going to have a lot of social instability um, and basically we're going to have uh, the groups on the left remember we talked about like the anarchists the socialists um, the communists are going to be trying to push the envelope and the right is essentially going to respond with um, suppression repression and bloodshed the assembly is dissolved in 1936. So essentially, even though we say that this Republican, the Second Spanish Republic, lasts until 1939, by 1936, um, the actual democratic functioning is over. And so um, we have in July of 36, we're going to have an attempted coup um, by the military, and we're going to fall into civil war. So before we start talking about the Civil War in earnest, take some time, pause, assess which, uh, assess the causes of the Spanish Civil War. When you assess, what you're doing is picking um, some causes and discussing why they were significant and why they might be a particular cause may be more significant than another one of your choosing. So pause and assess the significance of the causes of the uh, Spanish Civil War. And that is it for this and for me. We will talk about it in class and uh, fun times. <laughs>